Chapter One of The Way of Peace by James Allen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea Fiore. The Way of Peace by James Allen. Chapter One The Power of Meditation. Spiritual meditation is the pathway to divinity. It is the mystic ladder which reaches from earth to heaven, from error to truth, from pain to peace. Every saint has climbed it, every sinner must sooner or later come to it, and every weary pilgrim that turns his back upon self and the world and sets his face resolutely toward the Father's home must plant his feet upon its golden rounds. Without its aid you cannot grow into the divine state, the divine likeness, the divine peace, and the fadeless glories and unpolluting joys of truth will remain hidden from you. Meditation is the intense dwelling, in thought, upon an idea or theme, with the object of thoroughly comprehending it, and whatsoever you constantly meditate upon, you will not only come to understand, but will grow more and more into its likeness, for it will become incorporated into your very being, will become, in fact, your very self. If, therefore, you constantly dwell upon that which is selfish and debasing, you will ultimately become selfish and debased. If you ceaselessly think upon that which is pure and unselfish, you will surely become pure and unselfish. Tell me what that is upon which you most frequently and intensely think, that to which, in your silent hours, your soul most naturally turns, and I will tell you to what place of pain or peace you are traveling, and whether you are growing into the likeness of the divine or the bestial. There is an unavoidable tendency to become literally the embodiment of that quality upon which one most constantly thinks. Let, therefore, the object of your meditation be above and not below, so that every time you revert to it in thought, you will be lifted up. Let it be pure and unmixed with any selfish element, so shall your heart become purified and drawn nearer to truth, and not defiled and dragged more hopelessly into error. Meditation, in the spiritual sense in which I am now using it, is the secret of all growth in spiritual life and knowledge. Every prophet, sage, and savior became such by the power of meditation. Buddha meditated upon the truth until he could say, I am the truth. Jesus brooded upon the divine emanescence until at last he could declare, I and my Father are one. Meditation centered upon divine realities is the very essence and soul of prayer. It is the silent reaching of the soul toward the eternal. Mere petitionary prayer without meditation is a body without a soul and is powerless to lift the mind and heart above sin and affliction. If you are daily praying for wisdom, for peace, for loftier purity and a fuller realization of truth, and that for which you pray is still far from you, it means that you are praying for one thing while living out in thought and act another. If you will cease from such waywardness, taking your mind off those things the selfish clinging to, which debars you from the possession of the stainless realities for which you pray, if you will no longer ask God to grant you that which you do not deserve, or to bestow upon you that love and compassion which you refuse to bestow upon others, but will commence to think and act in the spirit of truth, you will day by day be growing into those realities, so that ultimately you will become one with them. He who would secure any worldly advantage must be willing to work vigorously for it, and he would be foolish indeed who waited with folded hands, expected it to come to him for the mere asking. Do not then vainly imagine that you can obtain the heavenly possessions, without making an effort. Only when you commence to work earnestly in the kingdom of truth will you be allowed to partake of the bread of life, and when you have, by patient and uncomplaining effort, 
earn the spiritual wages for which you ask, they will not be withheld from you. If you really seek truth, and not merely your own gratification, if you love it above all worldly pleasures and gains, more even than happiness itself, you will be willing to make the effort necessary for its achievement. If you would be freed from sin and sorrow, if you would taste of that spotless purity for which you sigh and pray, if you would realize wisdom and knowledge, and would enter into the possession of profound and abiding peace, come now and enter the path of meditation, and let the supreme object of your meditation be truth. At the outset, meditation must be distinguished from idle reverie. There is nothing dreamy and unpractical about it. It is a process of searching and uncompromising thought, which allows nothing to remain but the simple and naked truth. Thus meditating, you will no longer strive to build yourself up in your prejudices, but forgetting self, you will remember only that you are seeking the truth. And so you will remove, one by one, the errors which you have built up around yourself in the past, and will patiently wait for the revelation of truth, which will come when your errors have been sufficiently removed. In the silent humility of your heart, you will realize that, there is an inmost center in us all, where truth abides in fullness and around. Wall upon wall, the gross flesh hems it in, this perfect, clear perception, which is truth, a baffling and perverting carnal mesh, blinds it, and makes all error, and to know, rather consists in opening out a way, whence the imprisoned splendor may escape, thus in effecting entry for a light, supposed to be without. Select some portion of the day in which to meditate, and keep that period sacred to your purpose. The best time is the very early morning, when the spirit of repose is upon everything. All natural conditions will then be in your favor. The passions, after the long bodily fast of the night, will be subdued, the excitements and worries of the previous day will have died away, and the mind, strong and yet restful, will be receptive to spiritual instruction. Indeed, one of the first efforts you will be called upon to make will be to shake off lethargy and indulgence, and if you refuse you will be unable to advance, for the demands of the spirit are imperative. To be spiritually awakened is also to be mentally and physically awakened. The sluggard and the self-indulgent can have no knowledge of truth. He who, possessed of health and strength, wastes the calm, precious hours of the silent morning in drowsy indulgence, is totally unfit to climb the heavenly heights. He whose awakening consciousness has become alive to its lofty possibilities who is beginning to shake off the darkness of ignorance in which the world is enveloped, rises before the stars have ceased their vigil, and grappling with the darkness within his soul, strives, by holy aspiration, to perceive the light of truth while the unawakened world dreams on. The heights by great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight, but they, while their companions slept, were toiling upward in the night. No saint, no holy man, no teacher of truth, ever lived who did not rise early in the morning. Jesus habitually rose early and climbed the solitary mountains to engage in holy communion. Buddha always rose an hour before sunrise and engaged in meditation, and all his disciples were enjoined to do the same. If you have to commence your daily duties at a very early hour, and are thus debarred from giving the early morning to systematic meditation, try to give an hour at night, and should this, by the length and laboriousness of your daily task, be denied you, you need not despair, for you may then turn your thoughts upward in holy meditation in the intervals of your work, or in those few idle minutes which you now waste in aimlessness. And should your work be of that kind which becomes by practice automatic, you may meditate while engaged upon it. That eminent Christian saint and philosopher, Jacob Bomey, 
realized his vast knowledge of divine things whilst working long hours as a shoemaker. In every life there is a time to think, and the busiest, the most laborious, is not shut out from aspiration and meditation. Spiritual meditation and self-discipline are inseparable, if you will. Therefore, commence to meditate upon yourself so as to try and understand yourself. For remember, the great object you will have in view will be the complete removal of all your errors in order that you may realize truth. You will begin to question your motives, thoughts, and acts, comparing them with your ideal and endeavoring to look upon them with a calm and impartial eye. In this manner, you will be constantly gaining more of that mental and spiritual equilibrium without which men are but helpless straws upon the ocean of life. If you are given to hatred or anger, you will meditate upon gentleness and forgiveness so as to become acutely alive to a sense of your harsh and foolish conduct. You will then begin to dwell in thoughts of love, of gentleness, of abounding forgiveness, and as you overcome the lower by the higher, there will gradually, silently steal into your heart a knowledge of the divine law of love, with an understanding of its bearing upon all the intricacies of life and conduct. And in applying this knowledge to your every thought, word, and act, you will grow more and more gentle, more and more loving, more and more divine. And thus with every error, every selfish desire, every human weakness, by the power of meditation is it overcome, and as each sin, each error is thrust out, a fuller and clearer measure of the light of truth illuminates the pilgrim's soul. Thus meditating, you will be ceaselessly fortifying yourself against your only real enemy, your selfish, perishable self, and will be establishing yourself more and more firmly in the divine and imperishable self that is inseparable from truth. The direct outcome of your meditations will be a calm spiritual strength which will be your stay and resting place in the struggle of life. Great is the overcoming power of holy thought, and the strength and knowledge gained in the hour of silent meditation will enrich the soul with saving remembrance in the hour of strife, of sorrow, or of temptation. As, by the power of meditation, you grow in wisdom, you will relinquish more and more your selfish desires, which are fickle, impermanent, and productive of sorrow and pain, and will take your stand, with increasing steadfastness and trust, upon unchangeable principles, and will realize heavenly rest. The use of meditation is the acquirement of a knowledge of eternal principles, and the power which results from meditation is the ability to rest upon and trust those principles, and so become one with the eternal. The end of meditation is, therefore, direct knowledge of truth, God, and the realization of divine and profound peace. Let your meditations take their rise from the ethical ground which you now occupy. Remember that you are to grow into truth by steady perseverance. If you are an orthodox Christian, meditate ceaselessly upon the spotless purity and divine excellence of the character of Jesus and apply his every precept to your inner life and outward conduct, so as to approximate more and more toward his perfection. Do not be as those religious ones, who refusing to meditate upon the law of truth, and to put into practice the precepts given to them by their master, are content to formally worship, to cling to their particular creeds, and to continue the ceaseless round of sin and suffering. Strive to rise, by the power of meditation, above all selfish clinging to partial gods or party creeds, above dead formalities and lifeless ignorance, thus walking the highway of wisdom, with mind fixed upon the spotless truth, you shall know no halting place short of the realization of truth. He who earnestly meditates first perceives a truth, as it were, afar off and then realizes it by daily practice. It is only the doer of the word of truth 
that can know the doctrine of truth. For though by pure thought the truth is perceived, it is only actualized by practice. Said the divine Gautama, the Buddha, He who gives himself up to vanity, and does not give himself up to meditation, forgetting the real aim of life and grasping at pleasure, will in time envy him who has exerted himself in meditation, and he instructed his disciples in the following five great meditations. The first meditation is the meditation of love, in which you so adjust your heart that you long for the weal and welfare of all beings, including the happiness of your enemies. The second meditation is the meditation of pity, in which you think of all beings in distress, vividly representing in your imagination their sorrows and anxieties, so as to arouse a deep compassion for them in your soul. The third meditation is the meditation of joy, in which you think of the prosperity of others and rejoice with their rejoicings. The fourth meditation is the meditation of impurity, in which you consider the evil consequences of corruption, the effects of sin and diseases, how trivial often the pleasure of the moment, and how fatal its consequences. The fifth meditation is the meditation on serenity, in which you rise above love and hate, tyranny and oppression, wealth and want, and regard your own fate with impartial calmness and perfect tranquility. By engaging in these meditations, the disciples of the Buddha arrived at a knowledge of the truth. But whether you engage in these particular meditations or not matters little, so long as your object is truth, so long as you hunger and thirst for all that righteousness which is a holy heart and a blameless life. In your meditations, therefore, let your heart grow and expand with ever-broadening love, until freed from all hatred and passion and condemnation, it embraces the whole universe with thoughtful tenderness. As the flower opens its petals to receive the morning light, so open your soul more and more to the glorious light of truth. Soar upward upon the wings of aspiration, be fearless, and believe in the loftiest possibilities. Believe that a life of absolute meekness is possible. Believe that a life of stainless purity is possible. Believe that a life of perfect holiness is possible. Believe that the realization of the highest truth is possible. He who so believes climbs rapidly the heavenly hills, whilst the unbelievers continue to grope darkly and painfully in the fog-bound valleys. So believing, so aspiring, so meditating, divinely sweet and beautiful will be your spiritual experiences, and glorious the revelations that will enrapture your inward vision. As you realize the divine love, the divine justice, the divine purity, and the perfect law of good or God, great will be your bliss and deep your peace. Old things will pass away, and all things will become new. The veil of the material universe, so dense and impenetrable to the eye of error, so thin and gauzy to the eye of truth, will be lifted and the spiritual universe will be revealed. Time will cease and you will live only in eternity. Change and mortality will no more cause you anxiety and sorrow, for you will become established in the unchangeable and will dwell in the very heart of immortality. Star of Wisdom Star that of the birth of Vishnu birth of Krishna, Buddha, Jesus, told the wise ones, heavenward looking, waiting, watching for thy gleaming, in the darkness of the night time, in the starless gloom of midnight, shining herald of the coming, of the kingdom of the righteous, teller of the mystic story, of the lowly birth of Godhead, in the stable of the passions, in the manger of the mind-soul, silent singer of the secret, of compassion deep and holy, to the heart with sorrow burdened, to the soul with waiting weary, star of all-surpassing brightness, thou again dost deck the midnight, thou again dost cheer the wise ones 
watching in the creedal darkness, weary of the endless battle with the grinding blades of error, tired of lifeless, useless idols, of the dead forms of religions, spent with watching for thy shining. Thou hast ended their despairing, thou hast lighted up their pathway. Thou hast brought again the old truce to the hearts of all thy watchers, to the souls of them that love thee, thou dost speak of joy and gladness, of the peace that comes of sorrow. Blessed are they that can see thee, weary wanderers in the night time. Blessed they who feel the throbbing, in their bosoms feel the pulsing, of a deep love stirred within them, by the great power of thy shining. Let us learn thy lesson truly, learn it faithfully and humbly, learn it meekly, wisely, gladly. Ancient star of holy Vishnu, light of Krishna, Buddha, Jesus. End of chapter 1 Recording by Andrea Fiore